Well, hello and welcome. My name's John West. So where should we start? Well, I happen to believe that the function of the lung is best understood if we first look at its structure. This is a nice light micrograph taken uh, rapidly freezing the lung, so we believe that it shows the conditions during life. And you can see the alveolar spaces here, and in the alveolar wall, you can see the capillaries. And actually, you can see the individual red cells. And it's the blood gas barrier which separates the blood here from the gas here, across which gas exchange occurs. Now, this blood gas barrier is extremely thin, and in fact, we can't uh, identify it in a light micrograph like this. So we need to go to an electron micrograph, and this is shown here. Here's the capillary in the alveolar wall, which is running across the, the slide here, and we have alveolar gas on both sides of the capillary here. Within the capillary lumen, we can see the red blood cells and also the plasma. Now, the wall of the capillary is the blood gas barrier. Blood on one side, gas on the other. And we can see here at the top the very, very thin blood gas barrier. The uh, thickness of this is only about a third of a micron. Notice we have the scale down here. One third of a micron, which is fantastically thin. And you may notice, by the way, that the, this side of the barrier is much thinner than this side. In fact, the blood gas barrier, the capillary, is polarized, so one side has a thinner barrier than the other. Let's look at the thin side first. The outermost layer is the alveolar epithelium, very, very thin cell, as you can see, and here is the nucleus of this, as it's called, type 1 alveolar epithelial cell. Then the innermost layer is the capillary endothelium, we can see it here, and here is the nucleus of the capillary endothelial cell in this beautiful electron micrograph. Between the two layers is the extracellular matrix, <coughs> or if you like, the interstitium. And on the thin side here, the extracellular matrix is made up of the fusion of the basement membranes of the alveolar epithelium and the capillary endothelium. So the, the two Cellular layers are here, and the fusement of their basement membranes makes up the interstitium. Now, one of the most important constituents of the interstitium is the type 4 collagen in the basement membranes, because we believe that's responsible for the strength of the blood gas barrier. As you might expect, a barrier that is this thin is rather fragile, and if the pressure inside the capillary rises to uh, abnormally high levels, you can get ultra-structural changes in the blood gas barrier and leak uh, fluid into the alveolar spaces. Uh, that situation is called stress failure. We've labeled the structures, and I've done this so that you can come back sometime if you wish and just refresh your memory on what the various structures are, because it's very important that we understand the uh, structure of the blood gas barrier. <coughs> Now, we said that the, the barrier is extremely thin, a third of a micron in many places. And, and why is that? Well, that brings us to the principles of diffusion, gas diffusion, through a tissue sheet. We have a tissue sheet, for example, something like a, a postage stamp, for example. Then the volume of gas, which moves across the tissue sheet here, is proportional to the area of the sheet proportional to a constant, which is called the diffusion constant, and the difference in partial pressure between one side of the sheet and the other. It's also inversely proportional to the thickness of the sheet. And so what this means is that we need as thin a sheet as possible and as large an area as possible. Well, now, the blood gas barrier in the lung, as we've seen, is phenomenally thin in much of its part here. It also has a very large area. In fact, the area of the blood gas barrier in the human lung is about 50 to 100 square meters. Now, I like to think of the lung as a symmetrical organ, with the blood gas barrier in the middle, air coming in from one side via ventilation, and blood coming into the other side via the pulmonary circulation. And here we've got a 
gorgeous photograph of a cast of a human lung. The air comes down the trachea here during inspiration and it meets a junction here uh, which is called the carina. Carina is Latin for keel. And the airways then divide, the trachea then divides into a right main bronchus, left main bronchus, then loba bronchi and subloba bronchi and so on, all the way down to the alveoli. As we penetrate further and further into the lung, the airways become more numerous, they become uh, narrower, shorter, and uh, they eventually end up in the alveoli. Here's the trachea, or the windpipe, it's sometimes called, and it's constructed of cartilaginous rings, as you can see. Here's a section here, and uh, the cartilaginous rings prevent the trachea from collapsing when the pressure outside it is greatly increased, for example, during a cough. However, the posterior part of the trachea, shown here, is membranous in character, and there is some invagination uh, when the pressure outside the, the trachea is increased. Now we're further down into the lung, we can see the airway here, and we can see its branches going out, and here's another branch of the airway here. And we're beginning to see the alveoli in what we call the parenchyma of the lung. That's the region, the respiratory region of the lung where the alveoli are, called the parenchyma. Here we are somewhat further down, another beautiful slide. You can see the airway here and its accompanying pulmonary artery here with blue blood. And then over here, you can see a pulmonary vein. Now the artery is still accompanying the airway, but the vein has moved away to the edge of the lobule. And that will continue down to the respiratory portion. And now, of course, we can see the alveoli. They are larger than they were in the previous slide. We're going down further, and the magnification is increasing. Now, this is a, a more conventional thin section and shows an airway here at the bottom. You can see now that the cartilage has disappeared. There's uh, a, some uh, smooth muscle in the airway wall here. That's what we can see. And we can very clearly see the alveoli around the airway. And you notice how they're attached to the airway wall. We can also see the accompanying pulmonary artery with its uh, smooth muscle in the wall. Uh, we can see the red blood cells, and this uh, hole here is because of some shrinkage during preparation of the section. And you can see from here that you would expect the airway to be pulled open by the alveoli as the lung expanded. As the lung expands, the tension in the, wall, in the, uh, in the alveolar walls increases, and this pulls on the airway and expands it, and the same is true of the blood vessels as well. Here we are further down the lung, and this is a very beautiful scanning electron micrograph showing a small airway here and the alveoli attached to the wall on the outside. And again, you can get this impression that the alveoli are going to be pulling the airway open. You'll notice that there are some holes, apparently, in the walls of the alveoli. Uh, these are called pores. Uh, they're probably closed during life because of fluid lining the alveoli. <clears throat> Now we're even further down the lung, and now we see a few alveoli budding off the airway walls. Now, as we'll see in a moment, the, there are a number of generations of airways before we see any alveoli at all. But now we get to what we call the respiratory bronchial, where there are alveoli budding off the airway, and now, of course, these alveoli have a blood gas barrier, and they contribute to gas exchange. Now we're even further down the lung. Here's an airway here, coming down here. And now we get these blindly ending alveolar sacs, as they're called. And in the ends of the sacs are the alveoli. And then finally, we see the alveoli and the blood gas barrier here. Now, let's take an imaginary walk down the airways and see what we can find. We'll see some interesting sights. Here's one. Here's a so-called goblet cell. This is in the airway wall, and you can see an opening through which mucus is, dis is discharged onto the airway wall. The airway has a mucociliary system, and this is very important in uh, keeping the airway clean. Uh, there are cilia, and you can see examples here, and these cilia 
uh, help to transport the mucus. And here's a good view of the mucociliary system here, and I partly show it to indicate that the goblet cell, which we saw in the last slide, is here in the airway epithelium, but actually more important from the point of view of providing mucus or seromucus material are the glands in the deep in the airway wall, shown here in a drawing. And you can see a duct takes the mucus up to the uh, airway, and that's where the mucociliary escal escalator is located. And there are um, the, the mucus is tenacious. If dust particles fall on it, uh, they're swept up to, uh, towards the epiglottis, where they're tipped over into the gastrointestinal tract. Here are some cilia, beautiful electron micrograph, a scanning electron micrograph showing cilia. And also we can see another type of cell called a Clara cell. The function of the Clara cells is not fully understood, but they are believed to uh, secrete another substance which contributes to the mucus lining layer. Here's a drawing which summarizes some of the cells in the epithelium of the airways as we go down from the large airways through the smaller airways here called bronchioles down to the alveoli. Initially you see these tall columnar cells with cilia on top and maybe the odd uh, that may be a clara cell there or possibly a goblet cell. Then as we go further down the height of the epithelial cells decreases but they are still ciliated until finally we get to the alveoli where the cells are very flat. Most of the alveolar surface is covered by the type 1 alveolar epithelial cell. It's a fairly lazy cell, it doesn't undergo much in the way of metabolism, uh, but it's uh, very important from the structural point of view. It has a central nucleus here, like the yolk of the egg, but then spreading away from it are these very long protoplasmic extensions. The cell body spreads a long, long way away from the nucleus. It provides the pavement, if you like, of the alveolar surface. Most of the alveolar surface is covered by the type 1 alveolar epithelial cell. Now let's compare that with another kind of alveolar epithelial cell. This is the type 2 alveolar epithelial cell. It's quite different, as you can see. First of all, its shape is quite different. It's got a sort of globular shape here. It's uh, <coughs> got a ring of microvilli, little uh, sort of hair-like structures around it, like around the edge, a bit like the tonsure of a medieval monk. And you can see the holes through which, the, uh, through which it's secreting material onto the alveolar surface. Now this material is surfactant. Another cell that we'll see in the alveolus is the alveolar macrophage. Here's another very beautiful scanning electron micrograph showing the alveolar macrophage here. It's a bit like an amoeba. It moves around the, uh, the, the surface of the alveoli by amoeboid uh, activity. Uh, it can phagocytose particles, it can engulf foreign particles, and its job is to keep the alveolar surface clean. Here's the macrophage here with its nucleus here. And here's the wall of the alveolus running up here and running along here. And so what we've got is a macrophage lurking in the corner of an alveolus. We started off by emphasizing that the primary function of the lung is gas exchange. And so that led us to look at the blood gas barrier in the wall of the capillary uh, deep in the lung. We had a very beautiful electron micrograph showing that. We then took, took an imaginary walk down the airways uh, to see what we could see en route. And we found that the airways were lined with cilia and mucus, and we have a mucociliary escalator which removes deposited pollutants from the lung. So that's the end of our discussion of structure. My name's John West.